three cookbook authors set a standard for cooking in the 18th century. The most famous was Martha Washington, who directed her kitchen with great expertise. Not everybody knows about her relative, Mary Randolph, a great cookbook author on her own right. And the third and my favorite, Hannah Glass, an English woman that compiled many recipes cooking with plain and easy. I'm featuring three unique recipes. First one I make is a stuffed veal heart contributed to Mary Randolph, followed up by a stuffed veal press from Hannah Glass, and we finished off with Walter Washington's excellent cake. Mary Randolph lived in Richmond, Virginia. She operated a very upscale boarding house that kind of catered to the elite of the 18th century. Most people do not know that she was related to Thomas Jefferson and to Martha Washington. The remarkable story of Mary Randolph's life starts with her ancestry. Mary was a direct descendant of Pocahontas. Her husband's cousin was Thomas Jefferson, and her cousin was G.W. Park Custis, grandson of George and Martha Washington. She became very rapidly known as a wonderful hostess who presented a fabulous table. In 1824, Mary gathered her famous recipes and household management philosophies into a book she published entitled The Virginia Housewife. Let everything be done at the proper time. Keep everything in its proper place and put everything to its proper use. Mary Randolph's work has been called the most influential American cookbook of the 19th century. It was the first American regional cookbook. In her death, Mary Randolph accomplished one final distinction. She is the first person to have been buried in what was to become Arlington Cemetery. The first recipe is a stuffed veal heart. Now, granted, I'm sure not too many people are familiar or have even seen the veal heart. In the 18th century, however, it was very, very special. Calf would get slaughtered. You would use the veal heart as a dish. You make a stuffed veal breast. You use every little byproduct of the animal. The dish I'm making today is not an easy dish, granted. And if you want to make it, you can get veal hearts to any specialty butcher shop. It's not difficult to get. What you want to do, you want to trim down what they call the pipe. You want to clean it because this is the part that gets rather tough. Those are the arteries that go into the heart that pumps the blood. What's unique about the recipe, it involves quite a lot of ingredients for the stuffing. You have some ground veal, then you have some cow fat. Chop a little bit of cow fat in there. I have a little bit of beef marrow I put in there. Then I have some chanterelles, some seps. Important uh, tidbit here to know, once you get mori mushrooms, soak them gently, and you want to make sure you open them, make sure that all the sand goes out of it. The vendors usually leave a lot of sand in there to increase the weight. So you be careful on that. Salad and breadcrumb, little cognac or brandy, heavy cream, one egg in here, parsley already chopped, mix it all together. The best way to do it, let it sit up for a little bit so it gets more firm. Salt and pepper. A little bit of lemon pickle. Now, lemon pickle is something very, very unique that the 18th century and all the books have. It's a sauce that takes a couple of months to make. It's lemon, it's ale, it's different spices, and it just gives a tremendous flavor. Both of the 18th century authors, Hannah Glass and Mary Randolph, have both recipes for lemon pickle. Stuff the heart. We start braising the heart, bottom down. Dolding the hearts. Pepper. Dutchie is hot. A little oil in the Dutchie. All right. What makes this recipe complicated is the many steps. The first step we're doing right now, we're going to sear it in a Dutchie. Then it's going to go in a braising pan in the oven. Saute and braising action. So right now we're going to get some heat on here. Deglazing it, and we're gonna let it simmer a little bit, very slow simmer with lots of wine in the constantly. 
Let me get a dutchie off the fire and move it into the roasting pan. The dutchie goes back in the fire and the flavor is in there. It's later going to get some root vegetables into it. All it goes in here is a little red wine. All right, we're going to put a speck of thyme in here. So now I'm going to stick it in my beehive. Remember, it takes about an hour and a half to two hours, at about 350 degrees. That take quite a lot of time to simmer. Something in here. But this time is much needed because the sauce that you make for this is really what this is all about. In the dachi, we have the stuffing that came out. We have wood vegetables, onion, wood baker, celery yak, carrots, and now we turnips. Let this cook for a little bit. Take a time, bay leaf. Now you want to keep a candle fire, I tell you. Fantastic, I love when the plant works, look at that. Perfect. The flavor from the stuffing, the heart, and the wood vegetables. Now comes the mushrooms. And this one I said earlier, it's a very complex recipe. So I have chanterelle mushrooms, which are big pieces, like so. I have seps, the mori mushroom, just leave them whole. A little red wine in here. All right, the heart should be finished braised in my beehive. They've been there for about almost two hours. Now the hearts go right in here. Now we got all the bracing liquid that's in there. All we need now is some beef marrow. So leave this here, I'm gonna bring the brown sauce over. Okay. Brown sauce. Now it gets a little bit of heavy cream. And then it gets a little bit of Madeira. Everything in here showed us the kitchen sink, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's a very complex recipe, but I will tell you what, eating it will be making you a believer. It's gonna go back on the fire for very little time, because remember, the heart is already cooked, the sauce is already done. All you wanna get is the flavor of the mushroom. We wanna have a chance for the marrow to kind of melt. Now that will only take five to six minutes, if that, just bring it to, to a little bit of a, a boil, and then it's ready to be sliced up and to be served. Mary Randolph, you couldn't make the recipe any easier. <laughs> In all honesty, it's a spectacular recipe. When I first tasted it, the flavor is just so great. You can slice it a couple different ways. One way is to slice it uh, on a bias, or the other one is to slice it lengthwise. Not easy to make, I grant you, but fantastic to eat. Hanna Glass gives me the greatest inspiration for cooking. It's like she stands behind me every time I do a recipe and whispers in my ear how to follow step by step. That's why they turn out so great. Hanna, without your book, I could not do this show. In the 18th century, many of the great estates had reading glasses where they kept their precious books. One book very important to me is a cookbook written by Hanna Glass. Glass lived in London in the 1700s, and she had a hard life. Hannah was an illegitimate child and had to scrape by to feed her children. Hannah decided to write a cookbook to earn money, entitled The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy. Glass's genius was in making cooking simple. Until then, cookbooks were only written by men, mainly chefs talking to other chefs. The instructions were complex and assumed you had a well-stocked kitchen. Class boiled down the recipes to layman's term, so following her instructions became easy. As much time as will lie on a sixpence. Her scope and understanding of a full array of dishes is proven by exotic sauces to the first documentation of curry recipes in the West. When Hannah Glass's cookbook came out in 1747, some famous men of the time actually tried to take credit for writing it because it quickly became a bestseller in England and later in British North America. But Hannah never got to enjoy her fame. She was bankrupt and was sent to a debtor's prison. She gave up everything, including the rights of her book, and died penniless in 1770. It was many years after her death that her name finally appeared on her book, The Art of Cookery, which has been my culinary inspiration for 18th century cooking. 
Thank you, Hannah. Not too many people have ever seen a veal breast. That's why I want to show it to you. Now, to me, this is not very strange because where I come from, this is one of our unbelievable special holiday meals. So the veal breast that I'm making today is a little different from the one I'm used to making in the Black Forest, but it's straight out of Hannah Glass's book. Now, if you wanted to make that, most of the European butchers that you find, where they're boned for you. And the boning of that takes a little bit of doing because what you do, you French the bone. You French the bone on both sides. And it's not as simple. It looks maybe easy, but it's not. So you want to bring it back. You take the bone and you really just break it off like that. And you go all across. You can stuff the press completely or you can roll it. Hannah Glasi rolls hers. We do ours where we make a packet and stuff it. I do not expect anybody to make it. I just wanted to show how much work was involved. So if you would make this recipe from scratch and you tell your butcher to bone it for you, he will also give you the bones. And there's nothing better than a brown sauce made with veal bones. It doesn't get better. So what you do with the bones, you brown them off like I've done here. You deglaze them with red wine. Then you put the mirepoix into it, which is basically celery, celery root, little onion, back on the fire. And all you got to do with this, you let it simmer down a couple of times, deglaze it a few times, and at the end, you have the most unbelievable sauce. Some butter, a little bit of garlic, onion, bacon, and you want to just saute that. No color, just a nice saute, because if the stuffing sits for a while, the acidity in the onion and the garlic would possibly make it sour, so you want to make sure. But you don't need any color on there, just the saute action. Because remember, it gets later cooked inside of the stuffed breast. If you can't find salilan, any sandwich bread would use, but I would prefer use a French baguette. Now the salilan is a brioche. I cut it into a big dice, like so. You want to use a stale bread. The gluten gets awoken by having some warm milk. And keep it handy in case a little bit more. If you make that at home and you get in trouble that it's too liquidy, it's an easy solution, and it's called some breadcrumbs. Add breadcrumbs right into it and it will do the trick. Onion bacon, there we go. I got parsley. Not too much salt because the bread is already salted. And then a good amount of pepper. And then you crack a few eggs in there. So for the recipe, three eggs would be good. Can never put too much egg in there. If you get in trouble, just keep some breadcrumbs handy and you're in business. Now for this one, my hands. You just stick it all together. There we go. My bones are roasting nicely. The trick to making that is deglaze it a bunch of times. So now we're gonna do, we're gonna put salt and pepper on the inside of the breast. Then we take the stuffing, put it inside. Go wash my hands quick, my 18th century sink. And so there's two ways of doing it. One, it's the easy way, what I'm showing you today, is put a string and just tie it loose around, like so. You can also do something that is more, more difficult. You can take a needle and you can saw it, but it will work this way just fine. You go like that, all right, upside down. Loop it through one more time, okay. And now we need a roasting pan. I got some salt and pepper on the outside of the, the breast. Put the baby right in there. That goes in the beehive. Nice. Takes about an hour and 15 minutes, depending how much heat you have. Ideally, what you want to use, if you do it in a commercial stove at home, you want to start off hot and then lower it down. I'd say maybe four and a quarter until it's nicely brown. Lower down and you possibly maybe even want to wrap it in some foil or have a Dutch oven, anything like that, to keep the inside steaming nicely so the bread cooks beautifully. So while it's in there, we're gonna finish the sauce. Use Roma tomatoes, just like that. Cut really through and throw it in the... There we go. I'm gonna put a little thyme in there and a bay leaf. Stay right there, I'm gonna deglaze one more time. I'm just making a little bit of a mushroom sauce, which is very simple. Butter in a spider, shallots in there, 
I use shallots for that because more sweeter than uh, onions. And then I have some button mushroom for that. The sauce is right next to it. Look at how beautiful is that. Now I'm going to put some heavy cream in it. You can also use sour cream, but it really doesn't make a difference which one you want to use. This is done. All we need now is get the uh, breast out of the oven. Look at that, look. See how nice it shrunk? Isn't it gorgeous? Look at the natural juices in there. Beautiful. Cut this beautiful breast. The outer crust that you get from this tin is so beautiful because it's, it kind of caramelizes itself. Hannah Klaus, you did yourself. What a great recipe. And this is the mushroom sauce. Just a little bit of like so. Now this sauce has more power. All the goodness of the, the bones, the cartilage. It screams for simplicity, but it's so beautiful. And this is my tribute to Hannah Klaas. Martha Washington's cookbook basically is a compilation of recipes that she inherited from her mother. During Mount Vernon's time, at a huge feast and entertainment, she refined it. The book is now housed at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. This is Martha Washington's cookbook. It was not written by her, but it was passed down to her from her first mother-in-law. This is what she was using in her kitchen. This is what she was feeding our first president and all of the other people she was entertaining. The historic document brings her back to life. Curious of the book is this sort of gouged out part. We don't really know what happened here. A um, couple of thoughts are possibly it got into the fire, possibly something dripped on it and the mice got to it. Other thoughts are that if you turn it this way, many people tend to turn books with their thumbs and it could be the acid that burned through the paper at that time. There's so much talk always about Martha Washington being really into a lot of variety of cakes. Some people say there was three, four, I think there was actually more than that. But they're in the book as well, right? Yes, they are. Seeing the book, let me actually touch it. It's got to be one of my culinary highlights. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's one of the highlights of our collection as well at the Historical Society of Pennsylvania. What an insight uh, to Mother Washington's book. And uh, if you don't mind, I'll leave now. I don't think so. <laughs> Dan, you're starting without me already. Sure am. Let me introduce you to Diane, who's my pastry chef in the City Tavern. And one thing to remember, rain or shine, we bake every day. Today, we're going to show you Martha Washington's recipe for an excellent cake. It's a beautiful cake, Walter, and it's not very often reproduced because of how intense the recipe is. So where are we going to start? We're going to start at the very beginning. Mix yeast with a little bit of warm liquid. We're using ale. And the reason we use ale, because she used ale in her recipe. I'm gonna get this yeast good and dissolved, no clumps. Why don't I do this for you while you finish up your flour? The ale gives it a unique, distinct flavor when in the end. It's so amazing. And the All smell right. is incredible. Yep. One whole egg. And one yolk, please, Walter. Here we go. Beautiful. Add half a cup of half and half there, along with an eighth of a cup of sherry, so just a splash. There we go. And just an extra little splash of ale, just to get it good and liquefied. And today we are in luck that we actually have maize. Yes. That I brought back from the West Indies the other day. So it's very hard to come by. So we got the maize. It's gorgeous. Next. Next we have a large teaspoon of ground clove. Which we use a lot in 18th century cooking. Now we're just going to give this a quick stir before we cut in our butter. Just about four ounces. Just cutting the butter in with our fingers. This is very similar to, you know, your regular pie crust or many other applications. You can use a pastry bench or anything, but we're authentic here, right? 18th century style? It's not the same. Mm -hmm. You've got to do it like that. It's and you know, Mother Washington was known for her baking. Mount Vernon, if you think, they had 600 visitors the first year. Wow. So it was like, almost like a resort. There was always action going on. But we know that she took a lot of pride in how to entertain with her guests. So that's, Absolutely. Uh, all right, here we well go. There we go. Beautiful. I'm going to toss in these two eggs. Yep. And if you'll add just a splash of rose water for me. You see this ornate candor because rose water was very expensive then and it's very expensive now. Really all it is, 
It's the petal of the roses that gets fermented. And it has a very beautiful aroma. And it's a very strong, intense aroma of uh, rose petal. How much rose do you want in it? About a teaspoon. About a teaspoon. Perfect. It's a very um, overwhelming flavor. Oh, so. But it makes it so great, all right? Indeed it does. Okay, get a good mix on this. Then we're going to have our currants. Yes, currants and candied orange peel. Yep. The orange peel comes off the orange on the outside. Like so, would be cut up into pieces and be then caramelized in sugar. The same thing goes for the lemon that goes in here as well. Just a little acidity. Beautiful. Go ahead. I'm going to go ahead and get in here with my hands. Will you add about half of that bowl of currants? There's a wet currants that is dried. Yes, and they are Gives quite tasty. Very, quite tasty and also quite expensive. That's for sure. <laughs> the one thing about the 18th century, which is real obvious, they weren't worried about the dollars and cents, you know. That looks perfect, you know. So we're almost ready to put it in our form and we stick are. it in the beehive. The beehive, I fired up early, so the beehive is going good. So now we're going to put this in the oven. There we go. So how much time to bake? About a half hour. So then you're going to start on the, on the buttercream? That's right. Just finishing it up, actually, with a little touch of orange zest, which really gives it that beautiful orange flavor with the butter and the sugar and everything else that goes into your traditional buttercream. Oh. Ah, perfect. Careful, don't burn yourself. <laughs> All right. Now Martha's recipe calls for three layers, so that's what we're going to do here. Just going to slice it up with your serrated knife. Yeah, every time you make it in the bake shop, who is down there waiting for it to be sliced? <laughs> it is a little bit of a dry, more bread-like cake, so what we've done here is put together a little bit of simple syrup with some spiced rum, and if you'll add some black tea and a smidge of rose water. Black tea, right over here. Beautiful. And rose water. Fantastic. You don't want to be shy because the moistening of the cake is what makes it so spectacular. It soaks it right into the cake. That's what I really fell in love with this cake when the first time we made it. And you really want to make sure you get the edge good and soaked because that's where it touches the pan. That's where it's going to be the, the most firm and dry. Gotcha. The buttercream. Mm. How's that? Oh, it's awesome. <laughs> Next one. All right, covered. It gets now decorated on a beautiful crystal or silver cake stand. Indeed. And I've just done some beautiful rosettes and a little pearl border, you know, just to dress it up a little bit. These sliced oranges, um, and you're just going to dip them into a little bit of a sugar syrup. Bake them very low temperature in the oven. It's really just a delicious, thin, crispy little texture. Are you ready? I'm ready, absolutely. Let's see. Look at it. Oh, isn't it absolutely gorgeous? Mother, I love you. Now you can share my obsession with me, those three ladies, that drive me wild.